Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is a disease which was named after Jan Waldenstrom, who was a great old hematologist. And he described this entity in which the bone marrow is full of these cells which are what we call lymphoplasmacytic. They have features of lymphocytes and plasma cells. And in fact, it used to be a disease closely aligned with multiple myeloma in the past, but now we recognize that it's, it's really a lymphoma. And it can have clinical features such as an enlarged spleen or splenomegaly, occasionally enlarged lymph nodes. But what's unique about this disorder is the diagnostic feature of an elevated level in the bloodstream of a protein called immunoglobulin M, or IgM. And IgM, when it accumulates in large quantities, can have some detrimental effects on the person's health. It makes the blood sludgier, so you can get coronary artery disease, you can have problems with the lungs, you can get a stroke, you can have kidney failure. Lots of problems because of the thickness of the blood, which we measure not only how much of the IgM is in your blood, we measure what's called serum viscosity, how viscous, how molasses-like your blood is, because the more the protein is, the thicker the blood gets, the more sludging you get, and the more likely you are to have some problems with your vision, with your heart, with your lungs. Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is diagnosed in the setting of a lymphoplasmacytic infiltration of cells in the bone marrow, cells that have features kind of halfway between lymphocytes and plasma cells. And with an increased level of IgM or immunoglobulin M protein in the blood. Other features which may be present include an enlarged spleen, sometimes enlarged lymph nodes, anemia, and perhaps some other laboratory abnormalities. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish patients who have an IgM that's unrelated to Waldenstrom's and those who do have Waldenstrom's. There is now a test that's available that physicians can send off called Mighty 88. It's a blood test or a bone marrow test, um, either one. And you can send it off and it helps distinguish those patients with an elevated IgM called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance from those who have Waldenstrom's. And that's an important designation because one is generally a benign condition and one is a malignant condition. But we do watch some patients, the viscosity may be normal, the IgM may not be very high, they have no clinical consequences of the disease, no anemia, uh, no visual problems, no heart, lung, kidneys, or any other organ system problems of the disease. And we watch them, but we watch them carefully. We don't say, it's okay, see you back in a year. We'll probably repeat the test every three months or so and if it remains stable for a long period of time, may stretch it out a bit. But these patients do require regular follow-up because if the protein goes up and if the viscosity goes up, they can start getting into trouble and you don't want to wait until there's some organ damage before you intervene. You want to follow it, you see that the viscosity has gone up, you say, okay, it's now time to start treating it. There are other therapies in critical situations. You can remove the protein from the blood through a process called phoresis, spins the blood around, protein comes off, regular normal blood goes back in. Uh, but that's a very temporary fix. The important thing is the systemic management of the disease, getting to the root cause of it, the bone marrow where the malignant cells are produced. Watch and wait is still used for some patients with Waldenstrom's who have no signs or symptoms of the disease other than having some cells in the bone marrow and a slightly increased IgM level. The treatment of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is in evolution. In the past, we used drugs like chlorambucil, flutarabine, um, bendamustine is a very effective drug for these patients. Brituximab can be effective but can lead to what's called a paradoxical increase in the IgM. You give this drug, which should knock out your B lymphocytes, which make the protein, you would think it would go down, but for some reason, you can get a rapid increase, which can be clinically significant. 
Patients have stroke down on it and other problems, kidney failure, et cetera. You need the infiltrate in the marrow. You need the high protein. You find this, you consider treatment if the patient has symptoms or if the viscosity is elevated. And we, as I said, we had fludarabine, chloramazole, bendamustine, but now we have drugs like ibrutinib. And ibrutinib, as it turns out, the inhibitor of BTK, is probably the single most active drug that we have for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. In patients who have failed prior therapies, more than 80% of them will respond to this pill. You take a few pills a day, and the protein goes down. It doesn't necessarily go to normal. We're not curing patients with drugs like ibrutinib, but it brings the viscosity down, it brings the IgM down to a level which is consistent with normal daily activities. Right now, uh, the drug that is approved for the treatment of relapsed and refracting Waldenstrom's is ibrutinib. This bruton tyrosine kinase is effective in more than 80% of patients who receive it. Patients who have failed drugs like bendamustine, fludarabine, chloramucil, rituximab, and now get ibrutinib, and then you see that the IgM comes down, the serum viscosity goes down, symptoms related to the disease go away, the visual problems, the kidney impairment, the spleen shrinks. It's a very, very exciting drug for the treatment of Waldenstrom's, and it's approved by the FDA for these patients. Clinical trials are critically important for Waldenstrom's, as they are for most of our other lymphoid malignancies. If it wasn't for clinical trials, we wouldn't have Waldenstrom's available for our patients. But ibrutinib is, we still need to improve on. We have other drugs like ACP196, a second generation bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor that may be beneficial to these patients. But until we can cure everybody with no toxicity, we need to develop better therapies. There are a number of novel therapies in the pipeline, but since ibrutinib is so effective, a lot of these are related drugs, such as ACP196, uh, also studying drugs like venetoclax or ABT199, and other drugs that target B cells to improve on the efficacy of ibrutinib, either because it's a more effective, less toxic, newer version, or in combinations to try and see if we can put two drugs together and get an even better response and a longer, more durable response. For a rare disease like Waldenstrom's, it is extremely important that patients get hooked up with an organization like the Lymphoma Research Foundation to get information. Doctors in the community probably see a case of this every few years. In academic centers, I mean, I follow a fair number of them, but they don't have the experience to know what's going on, all the new advances, and so the patient sometimes has to rely on their own initiative. So where else but go to websites such as the LRF or the International Waldenstrom's Foundation, and on these websites, there's lots of information on what is the disease, how do we approach the disease, who needs to be treated, how is treatment approached, and what can you expect from treatment, as well as all the supportive care measures, whether they be physical or psychosocial measures. And patients really need to learn about their disease so they can be their own advocates.